Okay, today all we are continuing to talk about the rise of Muscovy. And in our last lecture, I spoke quite a bit about this important ruler right here, Ivan III. And it's on Ivan III's watch, um, who rules from 1462 to 1505, that we see the consolidation of Muscovy. I'm gonna pause here and make a historiographical comment. And by when I say history, historiography is the study of history, um, what people have written about the past and how that changes over time. In Soviet historiography, this period of time that I've characterized to you as the rise of Muscovy, or maybe from the end of the Civil War in the 1560s, um, the the Soviet historians wrote about this period of time as the gathering of Russian lands. And you can, in, and I just wanna pause on that way of classifying a period in history to point out to you something very teleological. In other history classes, you may have heard this uh, term teleology, teleological. And teleological means to have the end in mind. So when these historians said, this, what, this period was the gathering of the Russian lands, there are some assumptions being made there. And the assumption is that this territory is in some primordial essence, actually Russian territory. And it was just a matter of consolidating authority and making it all be one political entity. That's a very teleological way of seeing things in that it, it, it assumes that that's where history was going. These lands really do belong together. And it was just a matter of pulling them together and, and gathering them up. So I want to pause on that because even these seemingly innocuous phrases, ways of categorizing things, um, sometimes relay important and potentially problematic underlying assertions about um, what's what and where history is going. So in more neutral terms, this, is, this period is sometimes called the appanage period in Russian history, um, an appanage being kind of a, a territory. What we What we as historians don't, what we as early Russian historians don't really buy into is that there's this feudal mo model and that these are kind of fiefdoms in the way that Mark Bloch wrote about feudalism in 11th century France. But there, but there is this sort of, these principalities were um, autonomous, uh, more or less autonomous kingdoms that had a relation to each other, right? Remember, we talked about a little bit about how they all recognized a grand prince. There were, um, there was this understanding of being of a Rurikid tradition. Although, as we saw early on, the Muscovite princes, the Danilovici line that came from Nevsky, they're already kind of making their own line of succession that doesn't have to do with princes um, from other principalities like Tver and Raizan and yeah, um, from early on. Um, one thing, while I'm, while I'm making this point about, you know, it, was it futile or not? Is that a good way to understand it? And even as I'm invoking the concept, I'm saying, well, don't really understand it that way. One of the things that's coming up and one of the things that happens in the reign of Ivan III is that Ivan does divvy up and divide property um, to people. And one of the ways, one of the things we see going on in the state becoming more central and more powerful is the linking of having property, having an entitlement, having what you feed yourself with and also the thing you rely on in order to be able to show up for a military campaign when the grand prince calls you, um, 
having that asset tied to your service to the court. And that is something the grand princes try to do to consolidate their authority. Everyone needs to serve in order to get their get their daily bread, so to speak, in order to, to survive. And so in historians, there's a, a many books and articles written about these pieces of um, territory, these pieces of property called pamestia or estates, and whether or not servitors, whether they be boyars or maybe princes from another province that kind of gave over their allegiance willingly or unwillingly to the Moscow Grand Prince, whether they held that property just outright or whether holding that, and they, and by holding it outright, it meant they could do whatever they wanted to. They could sell it, they could bequeath it to their kids, they could divvy it up, they could keep it as one. Or if their holding of that property depended upon their allegiance to the, the czar. And if it does depend on the allegiance to the czar, you can see how that does make the czar more, um, or the grand, the grand prince, we're still in a period of, of the calling him the grand prince, not czar, makes the grand prince more powerful. I pause on this because as you saw in, in Herberstein's reading, a part of Herberstein that we didn't talk about in class, um, but is a much cited part of um, Herberstein's text is he is one of these, the first travelers who starts to say, the czar is really powerful. And I, I, I pause on that because in all the accounts we'll read, I want you to keep your eye on how powerful do people think the czar is? Um, we wanna kind of take stock in that in our four travelers. And then we'll also talk, continue to talk more about um, whether they're right or wrong, um, or if to the extent to which we can answer the question definitively. All right, so with that, that was sort of just pausing on the loaded nature of that term. This is a period of gathering the, the lands and a, and a more neutral way of talking about it is the appanage period. Even the way I framed it, you know, the rise of Muscovy, there's a certain Tele there, there's a certain direction things are going um, in a direction there. So maybe the most neutral way of, we might name it is appanage period, where all these different principalities who are making their own rules, collecting their own taxes, um, fielding their own armies, increasingly look to Moscow as the center of the state um, and the grand prince in Moscow who will become the czar being the most per powerful person in this entity. Um, this was, I, I showed you this last time. Here's a map of Muscovy with arrows pointing out. We're just showing you that Ivan is gaining his um, territory of Yaroslav Rostov, Novgorod. Um, that was a violent conquest, um, Tver Vyatka. And um, I, show, I showed you these pictures. Oh, the slide that we didn't get to the last time, as I wanted to just pause on I, the wife of Ivan III. Ivan III makes a quite prestigious international marriage. This is um, since the before the since the Mongol conquest. This is a this is a new move for Russian grand princes. He marries Sofia Paleologina. She is um, she is the niece of the last Byzantine emperor. So the last emperor, his brother, was her dad. Now, if you'll recall in 1453, the Ottomans conquer Constantinople. So the emperor is ousted, the royal family is ousted and they flee to Italy where they spend some amount of years before her parents both pass away, not at the same time. And once she's an orphan, she becomes a ward of the Pope. So we have, we have these lines now between Orthodoxy and Latin Christianity but still she becomes a ward of the Pope. And then Russian diplomats came um, and the arrangement of their marriage is made and they are married in 1472. Interestingly, she's married, there is a service at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and she and Ivan is in absentia married to her. She, um, then travels to Moscow, 
where she shows up in Moscow and immediately there is an Orthodox wedding ceremony. Um, she was of the Greek rite anyway, married in a Catholic church. Um, if you're a little bit confused, so am I. At any rate, so she's married again and also having two weddings. This is going to be, we're, this is going to come, we're going to see another second wedding um, during the time of troubles. So I just wanted to point out this historical example to you as well. So she shows up in November 1472, married right away with Ivan there. And she goes on to have, um, you know, decades in Russian history. And she's, um, she's, I, I would love to, I would actually love to know more about her. The, um, the extent of what I actually know about her probably comes from this book right here on Ivan the Terrible by Isabel de Madariaga, who was a wonderful historian um, who passed away some years ago. And, um, but but what, a, what a fascinating character. I hope someone will kind of write a research paper on her at some point. And I think that, and I, and I wonder if my hunch is correct that we might attribute a lot of the cultural change and um, West cultural change that comes to Muscovy in the late 15th century to her. After all, we know that these architects traveled with her and it's on Ivan, the, it's once she arrives that they start building these Kremlin churches that I showed you last time that to this day stand, although um, one of them, actually they started to build it and there was a huge earthquake and it collapsed in the 1490s and then they began reconstruction again there was a lot of um fear and anxiety around that act of god um you know what are we doing here <laughs> but they pressed on persevered and built these churches um and she brought the architects that did it um the, the some of the other um italians in her culture um we understand to have brought aquavite or vodka to Russia. She brought many books with her. Um, and so this is a real moment of um, cultural transmission. And it raises, as I mentioned before, Russia on the, on the international stage to make such a high ranking wedding. Sofia Paleologina is the mother of Vasily III, who's the next grand prince and also the grandmother of Ivan the Thir Ivan the Fourth, um, who, who whom we will spend a lot of time talking about, and I just want to point out to you that this is actually a late twentieth century facial reconstruction that was made from her skull, is my understanding that she was buried in a monastery, and when the Soviets moved um, that during um, the early 20th century, the Soviet period, they closed down this monastery and they exhumed the sarcophagus in which she was buried. She was re-interned in one of the Kremlin churches. And, um, and so I, I'm guessing that's how they had access to her uh, skulls. The, um, it's something we've also seen and we'll see with Ivan the Fourth. Okay, so the next grand prince that I want to put on your radar screen um, it, it is, Vasily III is the son of Ivan III, the father of Ivan IV. He rules from 1505 to 1533, and he, and he continues this um, state consolidation. On his watch, he takes Pskov, um, will also start to look to Ma Moscow as its ruler. He reportedly, they had a Vichy tradition as well, where you ring the bell to gather the the Vichy Council, and he um, reportedly took that from them as well, much as his father had done with Novgorod's Vichy Bell. He, um, um, Smolensk, and then Rezan, which is one of the last kind of, one of the last Rus, Rurikid principalities to be, uh, to be attached to Moscow, Muscovy, is um, acquired, gained, attached on his reign. Um, Smolensk, by the way, keep your eye on Smolensk. It's over there in the West and it's going to go back and forth and change hands a bunch of times. I wouldn't be so cruel as to ask you how many times Smolensk changes hands in history, but it is a, it is a place we'll talk about again. And it is grand, the Grand Prince Vasily that Herberstein is has his audiences with. Herberstein on both of his trips to Russia, um, are trips during which Vasily the second, the, the third, pardon me, Vasily the third is the grand prince. Um, so, and this picture may be one of the first, um, maybe one of the first 
likenesses that we could say, hey, this this is what he might have really looked like. And this was uh, this appears in one of Herberstein's illustrations. It's so kind of done by a contemporary. Not that that's a guarantee that this is what it looks like, but we are still in a period of time. The Italian Renaissance has happened and and portraits are becoming a thing. Um, recently not they haven't been around for a long time but we don't have any um russian princes yet that have sat for a portrait that will come in the 17th century so but while we're talking about visual things i just want to point out to you uh, um in case you read an edition that didn't have pictures these are some images from herberstein's text again um uh, one theme that historians nowadays are paying a lot of attention to and have paid attention to for a while is that texts are hugely important. Texts are what historians often study. Um, learned people that knew how to read could read texts, but there were a whole bunch of people that couldn't read texts. And so what was communicated, what could be communicated to them visually is probably really important for historians to take note of as well. So some of the images in um, Herberstein's in Herberstein's text, this is a picture of um, warrior warriors on horses. You see their chain mail and they have bows and arrows, um, no guns yet. This is a picture of um, sledges being pulled in this case by horses. Although as you know, in the, in the um, text, he, he tell talk about deer being harnessed and, um, and traveling and then even returning kind of like a, a um, is it carrier pigeon that will just go back to base on their own once they've arrived where they needed to go. Um, I also want to point out to you here, so uh, someone on skis that, and I, I'm a fan of skiing, so I pay attention. And um, here is a 16th century representation of Russians skiing. Um, there's even earlier representations in Olus Magnus's account. What you do, what we see is kind of one pole instead of two. And is this, you know, is this something between a ski and a snowshoe? Sometimes you see um, various arrangements made as this technology is is being developed and worked out. But point being, it's a very old technology and really good for moving across snow. As, as I've mentioned before, the temperatures could be brutally, uh, brutally cold, but winter was a wonderful time for travel compared to the muddy, buggy seasons, snow and ice could be much more reliable, lower coefficient of friction. Those sleds could travel well. Also, rivers are great for travel. Tons of travel happens over rivers, but you'll hear me say again as well, one thing that's a problem with rivers is that many rivers are um, in the spring melt, the water might be flowing so fast, it's dangerous. And then already by late summer, the water may have kind of drained enough so that your boats are, if heavily laden, are bottoming out. Um, so river travel, really, really important but also comes with some complications. By the same term, um, rivers can often be totally flat and travel across them easily, but sometimes you could have a kind of ice, ice break, partial breakups or whatnot for whatever reason um, that rivers could be even iced over, have a lot of unevenness about them. All right, and anyway, so some travel. So we have some visual indications of warfare, of travel, and here are gifts being brought in a diplomat in a diplomatic ceremony in a much more deeper um, in a darker and very ornate image there to um, and we didn't in discussion we didn't talk about his diplomatic reception but definitely bring that um, have have a look at that part you might want to talk about that in your papers here is um, the map one of the first dedicated to Muscovy maps that Western Europe um, has access to and it's written by a certain, um, it's, it's done. I, and I don't know if he did it himself or if someone drew it for him, I, but it's, it's called the Sigismund um, Herberstein's map. And um, it has, it, having read the text, you'll see some, some of the places. Again, lots and lots that's that's wrong with the geography here but we can make out so here we have our black sea the crimea here the sea of azov looms much larger than it does on our modern day maps over here mare caspium there's the caspian sea 
And these are the Caucasus Mountains between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Um, and you see various peoples, the, the Nagai Tatars the, in the Siberian province, Lithuania, Livonia. Here's that golden woman up here um, over and beyond what maybe the Ural Mountains. Um, and then here's Lake Ladoga, again, much bigger than the, what we see on maps now and even into the Baltic Sea. So that's one of the earliest maps. I'm gonna show you plenty of maps. So I want you to um, take stock of them. All right, with that, next we will start move into talking about the reign of Ivan IV in the 16th century. But for now, I will wrap up.